Check it out. I made this little guitar for Total Boat. Um, it's actually a gift for the president of the company. And um, I screwed everything up on it and I didn't like it. So I made this one. It came out pretty good. In this video, I'm going to show you how I made the one I don't like and highlight all the mistakes I made that I then corrected when I made this good one. And I'll tell you what I did different and why, and uh, hopefully we'll all learn something along the way. The request was for a mini guitar about the size of a ukulele but strung like a regular guitar. So I came up with this design which is basically an oversized ukulele body with a small 23.5 inch scale guitar neck on it. Before we get into the whole build, let's talk about the materials that I'm using first. Um, my friend Levi is a shipwright that works on a ship called the Ernestina, which was built originally in 1895. And at one point in time, he gave me all of this wood from that ship, which seems like the perfect wood to make a guitar for a company called Total Boat out of. Now, uh, the, there's some different species of wood in here. Right now, you see I'm using some heart pine, and then there was also a lot of white oak, and I have some really cool red mahogany um, that was from when that boat was moored in Africa in the 1940s to 70s, if I remember correctly. Uh, and you can see here that the, the problem with this wood is it's very difficult to get decent-sized boards out of it because there's holes and spikes and chunks and stuff cut out, and none of it's flat, none of it's straight. So it's a little bit of work to create straight, flat lines. Here, for example, is a white oak plank, and you can see how it's, um, you know, it's not warped, it's just it was actually cut into the shape of the boat like that. So it... It takes some effort to make sure it's uh, flat and level. I set up the sled to sort of level out one side so that I could then flip it over and level the other side. And the other thing you have to look out for is that paint there has copper in it. It's a copper-based paint that goes in the hull of the boat to help protect it in the water. So you want to make sure you um, need safety up while you run up to the machines and, and get that dust out of there. I had fans blowing and everything as well as the dust collection on. You can see once you work your way through it, there's some really beautiful wood there, and there's like that sort of iron acetate stain that happens in it from the uh, iron spikes in the salt water mixing together over the years. You get some really nice looking wood, high quality stuff. Um, it's just difficult to get large pieces of it. Um, right now what I'm doing is I'm cutting thin strips that I'm going to use to steam bend the sides, and they're thicker than they're going to be, um, but I wanted to start there because I need to layer them out. Here's another piece, they had to pull some rope caulking off of it, and and whatnot. There's, uh, <laughs> it's a, a lesson in patience and, um, and getting this stuff into working condition. Here I am cutting out a piece that I'm using for the fingerboard, and I also got the neck out of that piece as well. Now this is that beautiful red mahogany, and these pieces are full of metal everywhere. It's, uh, very difficult to use any of it, and it's a shame because it's such beautiful wood, um, but I can never really get any big pieces. I'll I'll show you here in a second how how bad it is. That is a giant rusted spike that you can't even see the difference in the wood, so it's really easy to miss. Um, I was sticking a magnet to it to show you, and then there's these other pieces, and they don't pull out. They've been in there in the salt water for too long. Really difficult to pull them out, so you have to cut around them, um, and you end up just getting small pieces of this wood. So I use it for accents, and that's what I use it for on the guitar. Um, just did the best I could with uh, what I could get out of it. While I finish milling down this mahogany, um, I'll point out that this is really my first sort of, quote, proper, end quote, acoustic guitar I've ever made. I did make one out of uh, hollow chord doors on this channel. I'll put a link to the video. But there was nothing even remotely close to traditional about how that was made. And um, this one I wanted to try and make a little more like a real guitar. I've seen pictures, I understand the basic concept, but I hadn't actually done it yet. And that's probably why I made so many of these mistakes. But that's how we learn, right? So next up, I needed to make some tools and some jigs to do this build. First thing I did is I put some um, MDF on my CNC machine to cut out some molds. Um, I needed two molds. I needed the exterior curves of the guitar and the interior curves of the guitar. And I figured the simplest way to do that was to, of course, just cut them out and use a relatively skinny router bit. I think I ended up using a quarter inch because I figured I would stack up multiple layers, and you'll see what I'm talking about later. But... Um, so I cut a few of those out, and here I made my first huge mistake. Um, I tried to cram too many of them into this one piece of MDF, because uh, I hate to waste. And, um, well, you'll see what happens later. 
But so there are my completed steam bending molds and um, that little gap should be perfect. And now I have to build a steam box. I bought the Rockler steamer kit and I made this box which I then coated the inside of it liberally with a total boat halcyon to help it last a little bit longer. I threw some crap insulation on the outside of it to try and keep the steam in. And um, you'll see here I also made another mold later on in the build. <laughs> But so first up is the steam bending of the sides. And I took those strips of white oak that I'd cut down to a little less than half inch and I ran them through the planer and the, the drum sander to get them down to less than a quarter inch thick and pop them in my steamer box. That worked pretty well. I didn't have the proper wood to make it, um, but and I just bought that cheap <laughs> thermometer at a supermarket and stuck it in there. And uh, it, it did the job fine. Here's my next mistake. I did not <laughs> let that thing cool off and I reached in and I managed to get a pretty good steam burn doing that. So you'll see here when I actually go and put my wood into the molds that I used a pair of pliers to pull the wood out while I had the box still on. And I put two layers in each mold and that covers the width of my router bit that I use when I cut these out on the CNC. So here's that mold mistake I was talking about. It is way too thin there to get proper clamping pressure and the whole mold was just bending under the pressure of the clamps. So I shoved that piece of plywood in there to stiffen it up a little bit. Next time, give yourself a couple inches around the edge of those molds to make them strong. I don't know why I didn't even think of that. Once I was satisfied that my steam bending worked, I left these pieces in the molds until I was ready to get them so they wouldn't sort of straighten out. <laughs> Okay, now on to the tops. I had cut this heart pine to use for the tops uh, and glued them together. And again, I started way over thickness at like close to a half inch, a little less than that, um, when I glued these together. And I wanted to plane them down once they were assembled. So I ran this in my planer to get them as thin as I could. The planer bottomed out around 15 one hundredths of an inch, and then I ran them to the drum sander to bring them down to a little less than 12 one hundredths of an inch before bringing them over again to my Avid CNC and cutting out the shapes. I used the laser to cut these rosette rings out of some veneer and uh, did that on the first instrument, but on the second instrument I did these inlays with epoxy like I did on the fingerboard, which we'll get to later. But um, this was a, a, a fun experiment for me, and I did okay. There was one spot I wasn't too happy with, but it looked pretty good. I used that piece of white oak that I cut earlier on my Avid CNC and I routed out a, a pretty flat radius. I think I went with a 16 inch radius for the fingerboard um, using a ball nose to get the whole fingerboard shape out. Now this is what was kind of fun and um, I, I came up with this idea to save myself a lot of work and it worked out really well. I created a graphic with some ocean waves and the Total Boat logo in the fingerboard. And the plan was, of course, to use Total Boat Epoxy with some tint in it to create this colorful graphic. I used their high performance epoxy with the slow hardener, and um, I like the pumping system. It was really easy to mix it up. And I made a couple little batches of some different blues and white colors and used those to create some waves. I wanted to give it a little bit of um, depth and maybe like some frothing at the tops. Just used toothpicks to apply it. It was a lot of fun. You can see that the, the boat doesn't stand out as well as I'd like it because it's a lighter color on that lighter uh, wood. And then here I made a mistake. I used a razor blade to sort of scrape off the excess epoxy and that blended some of the color from the blue waves into the boat and made it even darker. Here's a piece I cut out for the neck that I also filled in with epoxy. But so here was my, my big idea was I had left it in place on the CNC machine when I did that. And then I just went and ran that round over ball nose path again without moving anything to clean off all the excess epoxy. And then ran my fret file and cut it all out and finished it. But uh, that way I didn't have to sand it all and worry about changing the shape of the fingerboard. I had another perfect fingerboard ready to go.
See how the blue sort of blended into that boat a little more than I wanted. I finished sanding that all down and then did my fret work. Um, there's a, many different ways you can do fretting. I have this little press jig that I use in my drill press, and I did not have the right radius for the fingerboard that I made of those little press break things there, so I had to do a little bit of tapping with a brass hammer to put them in. And then I also um, put a binding on this fingerboard as well. I sort of designed it that way. Um, I just had some very thin strips of poplar that actually were sold as binding that I'd gotten uh, a few years ago that I just used a piece of that. So that was the only wood on this instrument that is not from the Ernestina. After gluing it on, I had to clean it up a little bit. It was not a lot of work. I also put like a little oil finish on this fingerboard, which sort of ruined even more of the contrast for me between the white of the boat and uh, the wood color itself. So when I remade the instrument, I just used the clear Halcyon finish on there, which helped keep the contrast a little more noticeable. And of course I had to sand and level all the frets, and I did that before I put it on the neck, so I'd have less work to do once it was on the neck. <laughs> Speaking of the neck, here's where I made the biggest mistakes that required me to make this instrument again. First, I made these templates out of hollow core door that I used to get my two basic cuts that I need to do on the neck, but I realized while I was doing that that I didn't make the block long enough, hence my first mistake. I had this idea to make the neck removable with bolts, and I was just going to put a rabbit instead of a dovetail on it, so uh, since the neck blank that I cut was too short, I had to actually make this sort of wooden slot that was in there, which was kind of... A little bit ridiculous uh, but then I was able to go in and start cutting out my neck which all went fine but basically all the problems have to do with that that joint it was a just just a bad idea and inexperience and you know we'll cover it more later but so the trick to cutting out the neck is to cut out you know both profiles sometimes you can use a little hot glue and glue the piece in that you just cut off to help make it easier when you flip it on its side but I didn't need to for this one um, I just simply roughed out the shape on the bandsaw and then I sanded it in uh, in many different ways to shape the neck. I did a D-shaped neck instead of like a typical C shape. If you picture a capital letter D, that's kind of what it feels like. Um, just because that's kind of how I like acoustic guitars and uh, it was pretty easy to do. So here's this whole, the problem with this bolt system was I did it all after I had shaped things out. And here I'm banging in a threaded insert to put into the block and um, I just... I, it was all just terrible looking and not straight. I should have done it while the wood was still straight before I started cutting shapes. It was just too sloppy. The other thing I needed to do was I glued that red veneer on that I had made earlier on the CNC. And then I used that as a template to cut out the slots where my tuners are going to go. I used the chisel and some rasps to clean out those holes. And um, after doing the bulk of the work with the drill press, of course, when I did the second neck, I used that top red mahogany plate as a template and I used a pattern router bit and actually routed that all out. That was a little bit easier. I also had to mark holes in the side and I had to drill a larger hole through the outside and then a slightly smaller hole on the inside to hold the end of the tuning peg. Um, so after drilling it all out with the larger drill that you can see here, I'm using a smaller one to go through this, that first hole into the center block. And here's where all those little mistakes I made start to compound as I try to actually do the final assembly. And I made some mistakes in my assembly here too. I'm going to show you the wrong way here and then I'm going to show you some highlights from the right way. So I pulled my bent sides out of the molds and I put them in this new mold I made, which you can see around the edge, I supported with regular 2x4 pine to make it stronger. Lined it with tape so nothing would stick to it and I had this terrible idea <laughs> of putting a bead of glue down and gluing these sides in onto the back and then going in and adding some kerfing later. Um, and the idea was, oh, there'll be enough glue to hold it still that I can go put the kerfing in and that's the order I did it here, which was just not a great idea. Um, when I did it the second time, what I did is I glued the kerfing onto the sides to make those rigid, and then I glued them onto the top and back. 
that way worked much better. Um, but so kerfing, if you don't know, is this wood that has these little slots in it so you can bend it, kind of like wacky wood. And um, I didn't make my own. I actually just bought that uh, just to save time. It was pretty inexpensive online. So after getting that back all glued together with just the sides and none of the bracing yet or the end block or the neck block, I was able to bang it out of that mold. And I was, again, I thought this is a good idea. It's like, oh, well, now I have a, a guitar shape I can work off of. I had made the tops just slightly bigger so I could do this edge band uh, routing and edge band it later. Then I glued the blocks in and, uh, and the bracing, but you're really not supposed to do it that way. And I did it the proper way the second time. Here you see I'm cutting the bracing and then gluing it on, but because the sides are there, you couldn't get a good glue point. It was just sort of dumb. Also, I don't think this bracing pattern is right for this instrument. It was so short, I just added when I did the second one, I did three pieces going across the uh, short direction to just sort of strengthen it up across that wide grain that's in that pine. So once the back was together, I leveled off the top and I glued the top on, which I did an X bracing on. And I'll, I'll show you later when I do it on the second instrument the right way. I created a bridge shape based on the Total Boat boat logo. Uh, on the second instrument, I ended up making that a little bit bigger and beefier because it was uh, a little weak, but it worked out pretty good. It's just a very simple design. Uh, I'm doing a nylon string guitar, so the strings tie on that end, and um, I, like, I like the look of it. It's kind of cool. Here I'm testing this router bit that puts a very slight groove into wood uh, for doing binding. I put a binding around the entire body of this guitar because that's kind of what you're supposed to do. It protects the edge and it's decorative and whatnot. Um, I personally have never liked the looks of binding. I didn't bother turning on the steamer for this one. I just used my pot of water on the stove. Um, I did this because you're supposed to and I just I didn't like it the whole time. I don't like the look of binding and on the second guitar I just didn't bother putting it. But um, you know, it, it it's alright I guess. There's nothing really wrong with doing a bolt-on neck on an acoustic. I've seen it done successfully before. I just did a terrible job. I didn't plan it out properly and I didn't execute it properly. So it ended up not sitting right and looking horrible. I went and threw some glue in afterwards, plugged the holes because they looked terrible, and then I covered up my seams because they looked terrible with um, just these little strips of wood. And even on the back, uh, it looked terrible. And so I did this sort of decorative inlay. And I thought all of that would make it okay, but I just, the angle just was just slightly off just a little bit. I had a slight angle to it, and so it ended up just being a real problem. This is just a quick addendum. I had so many problems in my assembly, I wanted to show you the right way. So I did turn the camera back on to show you that I did this X bracing in the top. I put it on as full strips and carved it into the instrument this time instead of trying to pre-cut the shapes while it was um, you know partially assembled and all that garbage. And here you can see my technique for shaping the sides. I used those molds and forms and glued all of the purfling on before gluing it on to the body of the instrument. I also just made the neck and the block one piece and I put a little slot in there where the body slides into it. That worked out fine and I used um, horse glue, hide glue, to assemble this one so it could come apart if it needed to that way, but the neck doesn't come off without taking the back off. <laughs> Okay, now we're back to the original guitar, the failed guitar, um, and everything here is basically the same as how I did it from then on out on the new guitar. I glued my fingerboard on, of course, and, uh, and then I did some sanding and shaping to put that all together nicely, and then I figured out where my bridge was going to go and glued that on. I didn't film it, but I put little screws in that bridge that screwed into the, the guitar body after the glue cured. And then when I did the second one, instead I actually drilled holes through in all four corners and I used little wooden dowels that I stuck through there to just sort of add a little extra security. I did some final sanding and used Total Boat Amber Halcyon Finish on the whole instrument and um, I just brushed it on with a foam brush on the first instrument. The second instrument I sprayed and I'll talk more about that later. And that's the great thing about this Halcyon. It's a water-based finish, it's low VOC, cleans up easy, goes on real easy, dries quickly so you can get multiple coats on in a day. Um, it's just really easy to use. It's the, the best water-based finish I've used to date. Uh, and that's sort of important to me. I try to keep my shop eco-friendly, of course. I've used the amber and the clear on several instruments now, and the clear is great because it doesn't change the color of your wood at all. 
and uh, it's really exactly what I'm looking for in a water based finish. So now it was time to set the guitar up and this is where I realized that all my mistakes compounded were just becoming unbearable. I cut uh, some Corian nut blanks and bridge blanks and started putting strings on and realized uh oh this wasn't gonna work. The neck leans back just slightly like an arch top guitar but the top is flat so I had to make this bridge ridiculously high to get the strings to stay level over the fingerboard. Here I am roughing it in and, and um, you can see here in the sort of final shots I never really finished making that bridge look good because it was so bad but I put the guitar together and it looks great and you can see it, it actually has really nice action um, all the way up and down the neck but it's like just looks stupid because <laughs> the bridge is up so high. That's the worst part there where the neck is kind of going in crooked. You see the fingerboard takes a little dive and it just doesn't have a good look. Now here you'll see the second guitar I made with the neck put in properly and that's what the bridge should look like. Here they both are together before we uh, continue. I want to point out a couple of very noticeable differences between these two guitars. Some things that, you know, after making this first one, I decided to dramatically change. The first and most important thing, I think, is the shape. Um, I thought since the guitar was so small, I could just make it an even three inches, I think it is, uh, thick all the way across instead of actually having it sort of taper up a little here like most guitars do. I didn't like that. so. On this guitar, I, you can see I sloped the back a little bit. Now that did a lot to make these guitars different. Um, most importantly, it made it a lot lighter. Between doing that and also, I was a little bit chicken uh, thinning out these tops and sides on this, and I got a little bit thinner here. So between those two differences, this guitar is a lot lighter um, and more comfortable to hold and play. The other big differences are on this guitar I put binding. It's there for decorative reasons, but it's also there to protect this edge because this, this wood can chip really easy if you bang it. But on this guitar, I didn't put it. Um, I just like that clean look and I think it's worth the risk. Uh, whatever. I did bind the fingerboard, however, because the plans I had drawn up were drawn up to include that binding. So I left that there. And I have a little bit more contrast, so I feel like the graphic is a little bit easier to see. And I didn't change the file at all. Uh, the same thing on the headstock, like, yeah, you couldn't really see the the graphic as well. The new one looks a lot better. Um, and also, I on this I did a veneer inlay, um, but I wanted to keep with the using all Total Boat products and using only Ernestina wood, so on this one I actually used the Total Boat epoxy to do the infill. Another huge difference, of course, is on this one I had messed up the angle of the neck, so I have this ridiculous bridge, and I was messing around with Corian, and I got it up and playing, but it looked stupid. That's where we ended up with this problem in the first place. Um, I. I like using Corian for nuts, um, but on this guitar I felt like that white really sort of stood out. So on this guitar I used some little ebony cutoffs that I have, um, and I made an ebony string retainer here and an ebony bridge here. I also made this bridge a little bit larger um, to work better. Another interesting thing is that I was using Total Boat Halcyon Amber Finish. It's a low VOC water-based product that they make um, that I fell in love with when I was making my double bass and it's like my new go-to finish for everything. And um, the thing I liked about it is that it brushes on really easily because I like to brush things on. I don't like setting up the sprayer. This is a brushed finish of this Total Boat Halcyon Amber and uh, it looks great. Um, but I didn't like how I could see little brush marks and little spots like this where I couldn't quite get like that even flow of the brush. So I decided to cowboy up and actually spray this one. And um, it's, oh my god, this stuff sprays incredibly easily. Um, it, spraying was easy, cleanup was easy, uh, and the finish went on really easy. This is one day of spraying. I, would, I sprayed six coats on it in the course of one day, and I buffed it out a little bit to give it sort of a satin sheen, whereas this one... I didn't really buff it out, I left it glossy, I put like a final coat on and never buffed it. Um, so you can kind of get both finishes. I did stop halfway through, I put on like think two coats and um, it hadn't fully cured or anything and I, and I sanded it because it raises the grain a little. This is an interesting video for me and I, I hope for you as well is that there's a lot of videos on YouTube are you know showing like well this is how I did it and they eliminate all the mistakes and they just they kind of put it out like they're the masters. And then there's a lot of fail videos on on YouTube where they show how they had some idea and they failed and I thought that this maybe would be somewhere in between that where I could show well I failed but I picked myself up by my bootstraps and I figured out how to do it right and uh, subsequently I, I learned something along the way. So you know this is really the first 
you know, proper acoustic guitar I made, and it's not even proper because the scales and proportions are off and strange. And I, I thought I could figure this out, and I thought it would be easy, and it wasn't. It was hard, and it was humbling, and uh, and I, I learned a lot along the way, and I'm very pleased with the end result, and I was very disappointed with the first one. Because <laughs> I have to thank Tolbo very much for supporting my work here and uh, giving me this opportunity to make this mistake and to learn from it and to be so patient with me taking forever to get the guitar to them that I owe them. So, let's go get this guitar over to them. Is that in the shot? Yeah. Sorry I'm late. Awesome. <laughs> I made you a guitar. So this was from your, your wife, Nina, had requested yes. this for you, sir. Oh, cool. Uh, what you don't know about it is every piece of wood that I used to make this was from the Ernestina, the 1895 schooner that's being repaired up in, awesome. in Maine. That's really neat. So this has a lot of New England history. Sounds good. Awesome. Well, thank you. Cool, man. Thank you. <laughs>